private work experience in Washington, D.C., Kevin's work as a top policy advisor, brokering legislation for enacting the telecommunications, technology, and financial sectors, which includes time in the Speaker's office and numerous roles in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. So, Kevin, thanks a lot for joining uh, us. Uh, thank you for the invite to speak today. Brandon with our street was tremendous help last year on our bipartisan privacy data security legislation. And anyone that set foot here that you know is the foundation that Ken Perry from Brooklyn has set for this policy initiative over decades. I also appreciate the input and support from Alexander and the organization for democracy technology in these negotiations. They all understand the enormity of this discussion for both our economic and national security, our, pers our personal rights, and the protection of our kids. It's a new Congress, and that means new opportunities. We have a historic new chair in Kathy Morris Rogers, the first woman to lead the House Committee on Energy and Commerce in its 200 plus year history. Our subcommittee also has a new name. <laughs> our subcommittee also has a new name, Brandon Roberts. Uh, to reflect the mission that the chair is directing, as will now be known as the Innovation, Data, and Commerce Subcommittee. We on Team CMR are excited about the opportunity. I'm pleased my counterpart, Lisa Hohn, is here today as well, filling the bipartisan successes, and look forward to working together with Team Cologne and our committee members. It could be easy to look back on last year and be disappointed that the APA did not get done. However, at the end of last year, a number of important bipartisan initiatives were enacted, namely the Inform Act and the Ransom Grant. Inform will set a new level of transparency and accountability for e commerce marketplaces to protect consumers from fraud, counterfeit, and stolen goods. Ransomware Act has a new level of duties for the FTC's Safe Web program on cooperating with international consumer protection agencies with a specific focus on China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. I know these accomplishments because they are relevant to the ability of this committee to get things done, and with our Senate counterparts. The Reform Act, led by Rep. Jean Schakowsky and co-sponsored by Rep. Gus Villarocas, will be an important check on big tech. And in turn, the Ransomware Act, led by Villarocas and co-sponsored by Schakowsky, reinforces the need to protect Americans' data from China, and other foreign threats. These principles are on display in our efforts to enact comprehensive privacy and data security legislation, protecting data, especially our kids, promoting commerce, and defending our country from threats from our adversaries. In the coming weeks, Chair Rogers will be laying the foundation of our work here by educating new members to the Committee on the Policies reconnecting with stakeholders from the range of civil society to businesses of all shapes and sizes as we look to revisit APPA and build further consensus. One thing I've learned in being around the boss is she doesn't look at a matter as a matter of words on paper, but rather as a mom. For that reason, she's very proud of the provisions in the bill to protect kids online. These are the strongest to date at any federal or state level. For any online protections to be successful, we need a strong foundation and a clear national standard of kindness. I know it is on a lot of minds today as well, and how many states are already working on their own privacy bill. Some of these states are even in conflict with their own state bills being proposed in the same legislature. That should give everyone just a flavor of the sort of confusion and conflicting signals on the horizon. Add to that what happens when states enact their own bills in California continuing to layer on regulations outside of the legislative process. Regardless of what we do at the federal level, I think it's safe to say at some point there's also a conflict with the Commerce Clause in the Constitution. I expect we'll all become Supreme Court watchers this year in the case of the National Court Producers Council versus Ross, which is a constitutional challenge to California's Congress as well. The ballot initiative that requires firms outside of California to meet criteria before their pork can be sold in, in, in the state or rich being shut out of the market. So that not get everyone's attention. We also have the FTC's extraordinarily broad rulemaking process on what Chair Khan refers to as a commercial surveillance. Without Congress intervening and getting involved, this will lead to more layers in litigation. 
that once implemented will certainly not provide any clarity for the state versus federal rule. That will give us all a lot to think about. I will just say, many years ago, I sat my then boss who served on the Energy and Commerce Committee on Financial Services Compensation, and then managed that the while in the Speaker's office, as it became Grand Lynch Flyway Act. Back then, getting the annual leaflet in the mail on a privacy policy and how one might opt out of sharing with a third party is a big deal. However, we all know that consumers want more than that concept today. My point here is no state is going to wait on this, nor is any other country who wants to eat our lunch on artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles to find a proper balance with competitiveness and data security. Look no further than China, where it's establishing national privacy law and championing companies so other countries follow them with standards, but the vacuum that we leave. Bicameral and bipartisan consumer privacy and data protection legislation is one of the most American initiatives right now to take on what everyone can win. Chair Rogers is excited to do her part in leading this effort to promote US leadership, ensure consumers have control over their data, and ensure kids are safe online. Thank you. Well, Tim, thank you, and especially thanks to Chairwoman for her efforts last year. Uh, now, uh, happy to introduce our, our next keynote, somebody else that he cares deeply about privacy, uh, Lisa Hone. So Lisa asserts that she accountable for the new subcommittee on innovation, data, and commerce of minority. Uh, but Lisa has extended experience leading teams of attorneys, technologists, economists, and crafting policy solutions to emerging telecommunications, and consumer protection challenges at the Federal Communication Commission, uh, the National Economic Council, and the Federal Trade Commission. So, Lisa, throw the happy community to me. Thank you so much to the RCP for having me today. As Brandon mentioned, I am the new Chief Democratic Council for the NF. Read my handwritten notes. Okay, it's going to change. It's like a committee, it's yesterday, but the new chief of the council for the Innovation, Data, and Commerce Subcommittee of the House Energy and Commerce. Um, as Tim already described, last Congress, then Chairman Cologne, now ranking member Cologne, worked closely on the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. I'm going to say 80, 80 88 from now on. Uh, with then ranking member, now Chair Rogers. And we uh, look forward to that bipartisan coordination continuing. The ADPPA, which was voted out of committee on an overwhelming and bipartisan basis, is the strongest comprehensive federal privacy legislation ever to move through a congressional committee. Given the time is short, and I know you want to get to the panel, I want to focus on five of the most important aspects of the bill. First, it creates a strong national standard that will minimize the personal information companies are allowed to collect, process, and transfer. Second, it gives consumers control over their data by giving them access, right to correct, right to delete, and right to report that data. Third, it provides heightened privacy protections for particularly sensitive data, including precise geolocation data, healthcare information, and financial information. Fourth, it creates really meaningful privacy protections for kids. First, by prohibiting targeted advertising to anyone under the age of 17, and also by requiring affirmative consent before transferring any data related to people under the age of 17. Fifth, it provides companies clear and consistent standards for collecting, reading, and sharing U.S. consumers' data, regardless of where in the United States a consumer resides. If I didn't mention your favorite aspect of the bill, I apologize. There are lots of other parts of ADPPA, and I expect the panel will get into some of them. But I do want to take this opportunity to thank so many people in the room, and so many people online, and so many other folks for the countless hours you've all put in to working with my predecessors, with Tim and his staff, uh, with other members and their staffs, with each other, your companies, your colleagues, your associations. Uh, to help us craft a really strong bipartisan privacy bill that we can all be proud of. Um, the good news is, and I think Tim really highlighted this, is we go into this Congress with a very strong bipartisan privacy bill. And I know that ranking member Cologne looks forward to working with all of you and with Chair Rogers on continuing to push that legislation forward. So thank you again for all your work last year and this year on the ADPPA.
Well, Lisa, thank you. And thanks for uh, your efforts to add me. Well, thank you in advance. <laughs> uh, so now uh, we'll, we'll transition to the panel, of course. And like I said before, there will be an opportunity for QA. Uh, and moderate our panel, some of the most of the probably read the daily basis. Uh, of course, we have Christiana Lima. Uh, so, Christiana is a technology reporter for the Washington Post, where he anchors the technology to a food newsletter. Uh, his journalism experiences span websites, newspapers, magazines, and radio on other mediums. Uh, his works appear in numerous outlets as well, including the Washington Code, Politico, and NPR's uh, WHYY, which is on the mountains of the Super Channel. Thanks for having us. Well, uh, the panel join us now as well. I think we'll take care of introducing the full panel. First. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you so much for that um, introduction, Brandon. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here moderating. It was a very timely discussion uh, as Congress is just starting up, and we'll see these pricing negotiations pick back up. Um, I'm joined today by a terrific panel, uh, including Brandon, uh, the director and senior fellow at the R Street Institute, um, Alexandra Reed Gibbons, president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology, and Cameron Ken Carey. Uh, distinguished Visiting Fellow for Governance Studies at the Perkins Institution. Um, so I, I'd like to start off actually with something, uh, Cameron, that you wrote last June uh, in a piece sort of breaking down the, the state of play on, on privacy. You wrote that uh, we're in the end game now. Uh, you know, since then, uh, we saw uh, the, the legislation, ADPPA, advance out of House and Community and Commerce, uh, but we did not see it reach the floor, and we also saw Senate and House leaders pushing for different priorities when it comes to price. So I'm wondering, do you think that assessment still stands? Are we in the end game still? Yeah, I think it's important to reflect on, on how far we have come here. Uh, and, you know, what? very grateful to Tim Eric for his, his shout out. I set out more than 10 years ago to, to develop national privacy legislation. Drafting that 10 years ago, we have come an enormous distance since. And you know, really the contributions from work, community work and efforts that CBD has done, uh, and Brandon's uh, work has built on that. But we really have seen a classic process of legislation that's very unusual in state. With hearings in which members of Congress, their staffs have gotten pretty deep into these issues uh, and accompanying that uh, the work by stakeholders across the spectrum uh, from the chamber of commerce where uh, to, uh, you know, to civil rights groups uh, consumers groups uh, to really catalog and uh, people like Tim Kirk and Lisa Holland and uh, their predecessors on the committees and in the Senate I uh, have built uh, on that and listened to that and, and crafted a pretty damn good bill. Uh, and, and it's a really made intelligent compromises and reached the right mark. So that doesn't leave a lot of other choices. Like, yeah, I think suggestions for ways to put in the others have, I'm sure. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there's there's not a latitude, a lot of latitude to change where we are without unraveling everything. Uh, so we'll get into some specific concerns that have been raised by a number of prominent lawmakers, but but I wanted to, to start off sort of on what, what do you, um, and I'll open this up to the panel, what do you see as the main issues that remain unresolved in terms of finding uh, agreement by Cameron Green on a privacy bill? Well, I think we're exceptionally close. And just to build on what Cam was saying, I mean, when you look at the, the developments that have happened, first of all, was the question of educating lawmakers, getting national attention on this, are people going to really give the time and energy to the proceedings? Then there was a push to figure out what issues need to be on this table, what does a package look like? And then we went up with the state issues, right? And people remember the two most famous ones is private right of action and preemption. And you and many others are article after article saying, how are they ever going to resolve it? And they rolled up their sleeves last Congress and figured out a deal. 
and people on each side might have thought it didn't go quite far enough, and, you know, but but that garden was struck, and I think they got really very close to to something that is, you know, so I used to work for Senator Lake, and I'd always say, as long as everybody gets, you know, 60% of what they want is okay, it's from about the end of the 40s, so at least you found that area in the middle. And, um, you know, it really has landed in strong place. So to me, I think now it's a question of political will. We lost time on the clock last year. Um, and so to me, I think the open question is going to be how easily can we pick back up? So that the committee now doesn't lose progress by reopening or relitigate the really important gains that were made last year on bipartisan agreement. And instead, now just using this moment to move the discussion forward, get momentum towards the House floor and then in the Senate. Yeah, and I actually largely agree with Alex. And I think, like any piece of legislation, it is about compromise and trying to reach consensus. No bill is going to make everybody happy. You know, uh, our, our government better, better scheme, like Canyon and I always joke, like, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's inspiring a lot in the audience, but um, if we were to sit down and write this bill, certain parts may look slightly different. But at the end of the day, it's not just us writing it, it's just not one party writing this piece of legislation. We need consensus from both sides of the aisle. It's just impossible to make everybody perfectly happy. Give an example like the preemption and private right action. You're already getting some substance now, but they're not interrelated. I mean, I mean, I think of that they are directly related. It's, it's easy to view it as a single issue, like let's solve preemption. Then let's go to private action. To Cam's point, it is a delicate balance. Uh, I strongly believe in preemption. I, I think this bill needs to have it. And I think there's a, a harm to consumers, national security, as well as industry by not being preemptive. But at the same time, I realize that came with a private action because of many calling for that. And I think we've done a good job of striking that balance. The risk we run is if we open it up and we start scratch by not starting with ADPJ, or at least something very close to it. I think we're back to negotiating, trying to strike a balance between preemption and prior right of action, which the can work. They've been trying for for many years, and we are just so close. Uh, I hate to just see us stop continuing to move forward because of a couple of sticking points. I think preemption is still an issue to work through to directly answer your question, um, but I am encouraged by how far we came. And I think there is a clear path forward. Yeah, any thoughts on main unresolved issue? Um, so I, I would echo what, what Brandon said. I, mean, I have certainly suggested one. I, I think some of the boundaries on, on advertising and how we deal with, with ad tech could, uh, would be probably better dealt with through agency rulemaking than, uh, than, than sort of a set of hard and fast rules. I mean, ad tech is enormously complex. And I can follow this. I, I have a glimmer of understanding, but it is highly technical. It's changing all the time. Uh, and you know, by the same token, advertising is also important to a free press. Uh, it is part of the, the lubrication of commerce. So um, you know, we need to be careful about unintended consequences to those who free services. So to me, that is made to order for agency ruling. You know, so some of the conceptual values that are in the ADPPA, but you know, with some uh, some agency ability to adjust those margins based on an informed record about what how how ad tech works and what the consequences uh, of changes to be. So, uh, Alex, you touched on political will. Something we heard from a number of Democratic senators towards the end of the last Congress is, you know, if we can't, if we can't find an agreement on a comprehensive privacy bill, we should not wait in expanding protections to children. Uh, and so, I guess my question to you is, uh, to and, and please open it up to the panel: um, if, if lawmakers can't reach agreement on a comprehensive bill, should they refocus their energy on expanding children's privacy? It's a great question because there's no there's no question that kids' issues is an incredibly high priority. I think for voters across the country, certainly for the Biden administration, President Biden has talked about this expressly in the last state of the union. I wouldn't be surprised if he does it again now. And you know, for Chairman Lawrence Rogers as well, we heard Tim talk about it just now. One of the things that CDT has cautioned about, and I think others have too, is focusing only on harms to kids. 
ignores a massive swath of the country and this really important opportunity we have to protect consumers across the board. And so, yes, while some of those protections certainly are important, what a hugely missed opportunity it would be if we leave behind all of the important privacy and security and civil rights protections that are embedded in broader legislation. So I actually worry a lot about just focusing on this one subset of issues versus really driving forward this moment for comprehensive federal privacy legislation in a way that protects everybody in a meaningful way. And not to just add on to that, not to make it too political in the weeds, but I, I am concerned that if we do something purely on kids, maybe it will take the momentum and interest on doing something on a broader level to impact all consumers and all Americans, because that's a win for privacy. But is it really? I don't like totally support giving privacy protections for kids. I think it's important, but all Americans need these protections. So by just singling out a small subset and we can debate the age that should start at or go up to uh, all Americans are at risk. And I, I kind of alluded this earlier. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, I think the main reason, one of them, if not the main reason we need to act now is, is the national security side. I mean, I, I don't want to drive this into it, you know, focusing on one app, but uh, uh, the national privacy will go a long way to help me address these concerns we have by adversarial com uh, countries. Um, and without it, we're all, you know, we're unfortunately all of us. So one of the particular uh, concerns with ADPPA that we've heard from uh, Senate Democratic leaders is the delay in the private right of action, uh, which uh, had been four years, I believe it was lower to two years during the markup. Um, wondering what you make of that and uh, the extent to which you think um, the PPA has um, sufficient uh, enforcement powers. Alex, would you like to speak then? Yeah, I'm happy to. So uh, speaking about that switch from four to two, I think that's actually important as a process point because one of the it was one of the real concerns that Senator Campbell raised um, as she was looking at what was moving through the House. And what we saw was the House committee turn and address that and say, you know, sure, let's let's make the agreement and let's cut it down. Two years, I think some consumer advocates might still think that's a long time. Others say, well, there's time for the FTC to do its rulemakings for businesses to get their house in order um, before the mechanism continues. So I actually think that's an example of the legislative process working and the people taking Senator Campbell's concerns seriously and really trying to address them through the House process, which is one of the things that gives me hope for how this moves forward is that a lot of her very important substantive contributions have been heard and acknowledged and, and addressed. On the overall enforcement mechanism, so the way that it works is enforcement largely by the FTC, state attorneys general, and then the individual ability to sue for many of the provisions in the bill. Um, you know, are, is it everything that consumer advocates wanted? No. Uh, for consumer advocates, a private right of action is, of course, hugely important simply because the scope of this, every sector of the economy engages in managing people's data. The risk of harm is broad, and the ability for regulatory agencies to keep up with that and bring enforcement actions is hard as well. And so the, we need consumers to be able to bring their own litigation to make sure that, that these provisions can actually be enforced. Businesses, on the other hand, rightly said, wait, we fear a flood of litigation, particularly in places where there are evolving norms. And so again, what you see is a grand bargain being struck. And limitations within that private right of action that were hard fought for by Republican advocates, by businesses to say, let's put some limits on damages so that we're getting consequential damages, but not punitive damages, for example. Let's have it that the FTC and the state attorneys general have the opportunity to sue before an individual brings a lawsuit. They get a 60-day window where they can take over that case. And let's make sure companies get notice before an individual can sue. So basically an opportunity to cure this about 45 days under the current bill. That's thoughtful legislating. Not everybody loves it. It involves some really hard trade-offs. But what they're trying to do is reach this balance of having people be able to bring cases, make sure that this law is enforced, but also avoid some of the concerns about harm to innovation. So I think, again, it's another example of thoughtful compromise. I'm Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, what, what Alex said about uh, a lot of the substance, uh, I completely agree with. I think it's important to on, on the two years to put that into perspective of other laws, uh, the GDPR, the European law, had two years before it took any effect. Um, uh, similarly, the California law, the Virginia law that just went into effect, all had two year run ups uh, before, before they took effect. So, you know, it does take a period of time to come into compliance. <coughs> 
So I mentioned that, that um, there are also rulemakings that would affect compliance in the rights of action. Uh, I do want to underscore what she said about the impact that Senator Cantwell and the members of the Senate have had here. Uh, and their thinking, duty of loyalty, uh, many of the provisions of the bill really reflect their work. In, uh, this bill, the ADPPA, was a product of so called three corners uh, agreements among the, the, the two chairs or the ranking member and chair in the House, um, but also Senator Wicker in the Senate. Uh, Senator Cantwell didn't join that agreement, but much of what is in that bill was a product of her negotiations with Senator Wicker. And Christiana, you mentioned when we were chatting before, subsequent drafts of bills that she has done. And if you, you look at those bills, the differences between, you know, if you start with, you know, where she and Wicker were at the beginning, that part, part. Um, when you get to the three corners, that part, part, and then if you look at differences between the bill, the bill is marked up and some of her drafts, some of the drafts, that was the two years being, being an example, some of the changes on other issues. The differences are really small. Um, yes, we are in the end game. Come back here over the question. So, so what is the key to, to bridging some of these these final differences in a way that's going to win over some of the uh, Senate Democratic leaders that have expressed concern uh, without potentially losing support, particularly among you know House Republicans and Republicans in the Senate? Uh, how, how do you hash out some of those differences? Yeah, so obviously, it's, it's no surprise the political composition in Washington D.C. has changed. I mean, now the Republicans have control of the House, while we have a divided Congress with uh, Democrats in charge of the Senate. Uh, I think it depends what issue you're looking at. If you look at preemption, we still that is still an outstanding issue. There are concerns we continue to hear from California, uh, which, in my, my personal opinion, I think that's that's unfortunate because while California has a privacy bill, the vast majority of Americans don't have a problem. advantage to the state little bill and it also highlight that this trend i hate to overuse the patchwork expression but it's real it, it, it's only going to continue so i think highlighting the potential risks is really important especially concerning a lot of members of congress uh it's important to kind of emphasize it then um and obviously you know with their speaker transition uh i know uh speaker pelosi who was very sympathetic to some of the concerns coming out of california that's a different dynamic uh i think one one concern is, and I hope this isn't the case, is that the House continues to do really well in the privacy bill. We see the continued interest in the chairwoman and the ranking member. I hope that interest continues on the Senate side. Uh, everything we've seen from Senator Cruz's office so far is that he is interested in pursuing privacy. Um, but just from a, a political reality, is it worth to put your staff hours and your time to it? It doesn't look like it's, it's, it's going to move. I, don't, I say that at all because I am really hopeful that the Senate side continues to put the, the time, the effort, and it's not diminishing Senator Campbell's current work. She's done great work, but it is a compromise. Nobody's going to be fully happy. There's parts of this, parts of this not happy with, parts that I'm not happy with. I think that's just common for most pieces of legislation. Yeah, I mean, my take on this is similar to a point that Brandon made earlier, which is um, reopening the substantive provisions. Is likely going to do the effort because there are so many different issues in the tech ecosystem that members have very different opinions on that are worthy of debate, but they get very complicated very fast in terms of trying to find areas of bipartisan agreement and places that are right for legislation now. So I think one of my biggest concerns is that we lose the progress that we made by virtue of getting bogged down in some of these big open questions because everybody's saying, wow, the bird in the hand actually addresses a very wide range of data harms. The voters are paying attention to, families are paying attention to, state legislators are paying attention to, you know, this is the moment. And to me, the question is actually a little bit less about what the substance of negotiations look like and more a question of timing and political priorities. So timing is to be getting started early enough to really make progress and use this time. The fact that we're having panels and significant staff uh, speaking this early in the year is a great sign. 
two is the political priorities piece of this. And hopefully what we'll see is just the continued leadership of the two main house leads on this, showing that they want to take this up and they want to push it forward. I think we are looking at some very hard debates in this Congress and very few areas where we're going to see Republicans and Democrats really making progress across the board, right? Not just in the next step. But here we have an issue that people care about where we actually know what a meaningful answer can look like. So is there going to be the political appetite to get the members up to speed and really move it forward? And that's what we're trying to see. Uh, so my my answer, Christiana, is is really what I've been saying for for two or three years now that, that I think a lot of the ingredients are there. The groundwork has been laid, the stakeholders understand their positions and have understood for a while what it's going to take to get this done. That what was needed was the political will. And we saw last year the political will, and that is what is needed now. Uh, I've already seen that that Biden's uh, has injected some energy in, in some quarters who started talking more. Uh, and I think some people are sitting on the sidelines so, uh, and you know, are, are proving up to the hill to say, we need privacy legislation. But you know, that's because whatever you said, we're going to invest unless they think it's going to happen. But they will be there uh, and at the table if, if people move forward. It's going to take exactly what but you know, the, the kind of early and focused effort Brandon and, and, and Alex talk about. Yeah, just to throw away if you don't mind, you know, something to add on to Alex said, I can see the temptation to make this a broader bill uh, in a couple of regards. A, we add other big tech measures in there, uh, like adding Section 230 or antitrust. I've already heard that river that we could just make this a huge, comprehensive piece of legislation. We have privacy, Section 230, antitrust. Let's add kids' privacy in there, maybe even reform financial privacy. Like all that in a big bill. Uh, it's hard enough to get consensus in a privacy bill. So I think what we need to do is keep a privacy bill. If those other issues are important to Congress, then consider them separately. I'm not advocating for that, but I think to at least get a win on privacy, I think that's the key. And on that same note, I think it's important to keep the privacy specific provisions in HBPA. And it did a good job of that. I think there is a temptation to start doing a lot more on biometrics and algorithms. Like, not to say they don't have privacy components, but there is a point where you cross the line, they become less about privacy and more of just a tech piece of legislation. Um, so, Brandon, you, you, you touched on the fact that, of course, um, control of the House has shifted. Uh, there's other uh, shifting dynamics. We have a, a new speaker that has expressed support for a uh, single national standard. Uh, Senator Cruz uh, stepping into the rank ranking member role on, on uh, Senate Commerce. How, how do you foresee sort of those shifting dynamics playing out in the negotiations? What, what should we be looking for? Yeah, I, I know when I saw the the potential that Republicans were going to hit the House, uh, even beforehand, really, I was really curious to see where the new speaker would fall on privacy legislation. I know I'm like, let me go back and get in, like when he was first elected to Congress and track everything he's done. And I'm not going to lie, it was dozens of speeches to see what he said on privacy. Uh, and obviously, it turns out it wasn't actually that far back, his, his comments from a few years ago were that privacy is important. And specifically, we need preemption. Uh, and and I, I agree with that approach. And I was also thrilled to see that the Republicans, if they took the House, put this as one of their priority items. Um, obviously, there's a lot of competing priorities in, in Washington, D.C., so I, I don't want to say this is happening tomorrow or doing a committee vote next week and it's going to be a House vote within a month. You know, that, that might, that'd be phenomenal. I, I, am, I have some degree of reality. But I, I've seen everything that the Republicans are interested in privacy. And I think that's key to, sh to show that this isn't just a partisan issue. This is a Republican bill, Democrat bill. Everybody in the audience and watching that has a constituency, you should be expressing that this is, is really important. I, I do think from you know Republicans especially, and this is something I truly value, and I alluded to it earlier, is the really the national security and cyber security component of this. Some people will jump all over me saying, well, privacy and cyber, there is a difference, and you're complaining the two. I ever like that. But it, we can't diminish the fact that without rules of the road on how we're collecting data, who's getting it, how they're using it, there's nothing stopping an adversary or a bad actor, a bad company. We have many great companies regardless of size in this country, other really bad ones regardless of size. And I think that's the reason we need this. And I think that there is specifically touching in security and the national security has not been part of the debate. It really has, minus a few speeches. 
Um, I'm hopeful that narrative will continue because I think that is one of the most pressing needs for the first issue. I think another thing to pick up on and to mention this in his remarks is how this might have been the competitiveness conversation. And the reality is that right now we have seated our leadership on the global stage on these really important questions of how technology can be regulated in a way that promotes innovation, but also make sure that technology works for people. And in the absence of that, what we're seeing is other regions around the world stepping in, making their own measures that then have you know, copied in other, in other areas but also that the U.S. just doesn't have an equal seat at the table. Um, we're seeing things like the cross-border data flows decisions coming out of Europe, for example, and the U.S. doesn't have a good answer unless we show that we can have strong federal leadership to protect people's rights. So there's a real opportunity here for the U.S. to get that balance right, to lead into it, and to show our leadership on this, much as there's a big conversation around the U.S. responsible use of AI, for example. Um, so there's an opportunity here, and again, an important one if you want to say we've done for this. I mean, I, I don't I don't say this to be funny, but even China has a project to build. Granted, do they actually follow what's written down? That's a whole different thing. But I think they have a bill. So it forces American companies to follow bills like the GDPR in China, which GDPR, there are positive aspects. I don't want to diminish that. But at the end of the day, it's not an American bill. There are better approaches to Alex's point. Like, we were forced to follow stuff like that, absent action. So, really, that. And I was glad to hear Tim mention China specifically. So, uh, Pam, you, you touched on the recent op ed by President Biden, which one of the uh, areas in which he called for action is data privacy. Uh, one thing that jumped out to me is he said that Congress should, quote, limit targeted advertising and ban it altogether for children. Uh, so, of course, ADPBA and other proposals have restrictions on, around. Uh, at, targeted advertising to children, but I thought the limiting uh, ad targeting more broadly was interesting. I was wondering what you made of those remarks and to what extent you think uh, the proposals that are on the table address the concerns raised by the government? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, essentially the Biden op-ed was describing the ADPPA. Uh, it has a ban on targeted advertising to children. Uh, it has, it, it change, changes the rules for targeted advertising, uh, you know, that by and large, that's primarily permitted in the first party context. So if you have a direct relationship with, with a company versus using and tracking and other way, uh, third party cookies and other ways of delivering uh, delivering ads, I am, uh, and it would significantly uh, restrict behavioral advertising. I think those are the provisions that uh, I was talking about when I, when I said that, that you know, there's, I see room for rulemaking to adjust uh, some of the questions of you know, what uses of sensitive data um, might, uh, might be permissible uh, for certain kinds of advertising. Uh, uh, to what extent do you restrict events in the behavioral advertising? You know, so much of this, is contextual. That's one of the big challenges of, of privacy. Um, so, uh, creating a set of rules that, that maybe allows a little bit more contextual variation um, could be useful for consumers, uh, useful to to the ecosystem, useful to publications. Uh, Free services, Other thoughts on the extent to which approvals on the table address the concerns raised by President Biden specifically? Sure. I mean, I think that. Uh... That yes, I was encouraged by that. And of all the order of priorities in that op-ed, perhaps he was first, and I think that's notable. Um, and so it's great to see the administration leaning into this as an opportunity. And I think, again, looking for areas of bipartisan compromise, this is one where they actually could deliver that could be could be a win for all sides. So I think that is really important. The advertising conversation, I think, is a rich one to have, right? Because there are some people who are raising concerns about the bill, saying this is the death knell of all advertising. What is going to happen to the free and open internet? How do we think about I mean, what this is going to look like going forward? And that's another area where it's just really important that we have a nuanced conversation about what the bill will and will do, and what consumers expect of advertising in 2023, and hope the rules of the road will be going forward. And there, I think, 
the reality is that users, when they actually understand the extreme level of targeting that can happen and is used right now in the advertising ecosystem, they're greatly concerned about that. There's a reason why states across the country are talking about this. Um, there's a reason why you know, governments around the globe are talking about this issue too. But I think what's really important is that one can have ads, right? you can have limits on behavioral advertising, you can restrict the sharing, the collection sharing and long-term storage of highly sensitive information, and still have an ecosystem where people see ads. It existed for decades before we moved into the current world we have of extreme targeting. So for me, one of the things that I think about you know, advertisers are one of the most innovative second sectors of the economy, right? And they have been for a long time. Advertisers can do that. So what does the future of advertising look like? It's creative use of contextual ads. It's thinking more about what users are choosing and how they're signaling their own preferences. Um, and I think there's a really important creative dialogue to be had there that doesn't need to sound the death knell of Judy Bloom about how the online ecosystem operates. I believe very much that we need to be having free online services. My organization focuses on this all the time about access to information. But creating this false binary between strong user privacy protections and an open, accessible, affordable web really is a false distinction that we need to shut down. Yeah, I I want to be clear that that you know I well I, well I see valid uses and important uses to to advertising. I even say to advertising. Organization advertisers for, for several years now. The system is broken, and they need to understand that that advertising needs to change. The the, in, the information ecosystems in advertising are extraordinarily leaking from from you know the the app development interfaces, the APIs, uh, and software development kits. Uh, in, to the ad tech platforms, the way that advertising is, is tracked and shared across the ecosystem to enable that. And you know, the, the purchase and sale of data with particulars uh, is responsible for an awful lot of our, our information being out there in the wild. So that, that needs to change. Uh, and, but we need to recognize some of the legitimate uses of those functions too. Yeah, so I'll start with President Biden's stop in and then talk about advertising. Where do I start with the President stop in? Uh, so there's parts I like, also parts I have strong concerns with. I was thrilled to see the President place an emphasis on privacy. I think we all agree with the Privacy Act. I actually wish a call for privacy happened months ago. I think that was actually sure. getting them in from the ADPA. Uh, and some were looking for the president to take a strong stand last Congress. So I may have to see that. Uh, the concerns are, I think, some of the positive value of adding privacy were overshadowed by adding other controversial measures like content moderation and antitrust. I don't think that helped. I think it would be better off to make a stronger stance on privacy. Secondly, I also don't think the characterization that it was big tech focus. Uh, I'm not saying that all big companies are the best actor, but it's not contingent to size. We see many privacy arms companies of all sizes, small, medium, stuff, and large businesses. So I think just solely focusing on our largest companies isn't helping the dialogue at, at all. Not saying there aren't harms, um, no matter what the company is, but it's a pervasive issue that conference privacy legislation would help solve. Uh, you just inadvertently set up my question, my next question very well. Your plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, <it's fine. laughs> um, a lot of the rhetoric. Uh, around data privacy consciousness, I think there are a lot of these issues is around bringing in big tech and focuses on the large companies. Um, but of course, a lot of these proposals would impact the broad swath of the companies. Uh, but one interesting way that I think we've seen that play out in the, the privacy discussions is seeing some some heightened obligations for larger internet services. So in the EDPA, there is a tiered knowledge standard that has sort of heightened requirements um, for, for larger services. What, what do you guys think of, of that approach um, uh, in ADPA and then more about it? So I, I think that that is, that is the right approach. I, I think it's important to remember that, that in this day and age, almost every company is a tech company and is online and is using data in, in some form. Uh, ADPA would, would include 
uh, analog data, right? And that still it exists. But yeah, I think it is important to to graduate the, the obligations. And that was that was an important element in a sort of a smaller grand bargain that we included when going on three years ago. We laid out some of the contours of, of compromise on preemption, on private right of action, and on, on other issues. With the kind of tier obligations uh, to have a baseline and say, look, everybody is subject uh, to this act. Everybody has some, some basic privacy obligations, data minimization, um, to security. But that, you know, as you get bigger, uh, those those can, can scale up. Um, but but uh, recognizing that that you know, at the lower levels, yeah, there are, there are compliance burdens that result from this. So so they they should be different. So having smaller providers and category large data holders and then people in between makes a lot of sense to me as as an appropriate and calibrated way to deal with these issues. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And one of the things to think about is to, to a point Brandon made earlier, yes, certainly people can worry about when we're perpetrated by big platforms, and that's a big area of focus. But often small players are also incentivized to have data practices that involve the widespread sale of people's data, for example, because it's an early pathway to monetization. And so this is why we need based on the of the road. I think about one of the most famous examples that they gets talked about is the flashlight app on, on Google's phone. And so you know, many people downloaded it because they wanted the flashlight on their phone, but what was the monetization model that was selling people's very precise geolocation data and just because they had that app now installed. That's the type of thing that we want to strong disincentivize, right? That is the exact type of thing that causes me to extreme surprise when we learn about it, most of us are shocked and, and, and instantly anger, and the type of thing that we need to move the industry away from. And so I think it is important to have baseline expectations no matter your size, but then to calibrate some of the higher burdens that are important. Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate what Alex said in terms of size, like, and I alluded to this earlier, some of these harms aren't for size dependent. I mean, some of our most egregious privacy violations have come from the smallest of small companies, like the smaller data brokers. Not to take this into a whole different panel conversation, but, but it's a reality. They may only have one or two people that actually work there, but they're collecting super sensitive data and exploiting it, sending it to adversarial countries, targeting very sensitive members in our you know, population, whether it be members of the military, members of the intelligence community, it's happening, unfortunately. So I would, I would caution that. At the same time, we can make sure that we do care about small, medium-sized businesses, um, because a small company isn't going to have the resources to comply that like a large company would have. And we don't want our, like, to overuse this expression, the main straight mom and pop, you know, convenience store that doesn't collect much data being subject to everything in ADPPA. And I think that's a good, that's a good balance there. I think there's a lot of people who still like to see it go farther. Uh, but there are small business exceptions, and I think that's important that we continue to keep in mind small entities in this one. Uh, we're coming up on, on 5 p.m., so I just wanted to have some more questions for our panelists, but I just wanted to remind everyone that we're going to open it up to the audience. If anyone has any questions, so um, start thinking about those, and we'll give them right back to you. Um, so NTIA recently put out a, a request for a comment on the introduction of, of privacy, civil rights, equity. Um, Wondering if you um and perhaps you can you can uh, start with this one. Uh, what do you see as some of the underlying principles needed in legislation to, to safeguard both pieces? Well, I think the, the ADPPA makes a good start. I mean, first of all, it has a civil rights provision. Uh, that that is a groundbreaking element and something that distinguishes it from the California law and from it. From other state laws. Uh, and I think it's one of the aspects in which it moves beyond the GDPR or other laws around the world. And as we focus increasingly on, on equity and the impact of, of technology and the algorithms, that is an, an important to ingredient. Uh, and, you know, I think the NGIA process will, will help us inform. Our understanding of how this coordination operates. A lot of work being done in this. Um, you know, the OSTP put out the, the 
AI uh, Bill of Rights blueprint, but a lot of a lot of the real content there is in, in the fact sheet that talks about the various agencies, the, the CFPB and uh, others uh, are doing to look at discrimination in a very specific contexts and look at the operation of algorithms there. I think ADPA starts us down that road and we has provisions it will help improve understanding of our burdens, both within uh, the organizations that are growing, but more broadly uh, across society. Kim speaks to a really important value out of what the NTA process is going to do, because correctly, ADPA has provisions on this, but this is actually about a lot more than just legislation. A huge battle in the effort to protect against discriminatory uses of data. It's educating regulators about how the current civil rights laws apply to online behavior, and then educating decision makers, whether it's employers, product developers, companies, about what potential harms might be and how to mitigate them. And that's some of the effort that we see happening. Can mention some of the agencies that are focused on this right now. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is one. Housing and Urban Development just had their settlement with Meta, the final details of which were released uh, a couple of weeks ago. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is doing a ton of work on this. And when I look at that, that's an all of the above strategy that we need because it's not just about new legislation, although I think those provisions are hugely important, but also just helping a broader swath of people understand what the harms are and the role that they can play in helping to mitigate them. So the NTIA process, I think, is going to be really useful in just surfacing more of those examples, surfacing what some of the existing legal frameworks, how they speak to that. And then helping people understand the role that they need to play in mitigating them. Yeah, so, so naturally, uh, maybe, maybe come no surprise to most people here. I, I, I'm not a fan of the heavy agency involvement. So far, in, in NTIA's defense, it does look like it's just going to be a report. But if we do extend it to like what the FTC or Federal Trade Commission is considering doing, you know, it would be a rulemaking that would theoretically revamp the water park for our economy. I, I am not going to say that the, hopefully not, the FTC doesn't go and embark on a 95. Uh, question rulemaking like they initially put out. I understand it's probably being forced back. I, I do think this is a real opportunity for Congress to drive forward and show what privacy should be. At the same time, giving clearly defined lanes for agency to act. Uh, ADPPA clearly says where FPC should do rulemaking, where they should do acting, where they should create new offices. I know Cam more of an expert on the FPC than I am, but I would prefer Congress to set the policy, set the direction, then have agencies come back and support all offer assistance rather than just taking a proactive approach and trying to really reconfigure privacy absent anything uh, being done by Congress. Uh, so, so something that we've uh, alluded to, but is kind of hovering over um, all these negotiations is that, that states are moving ahead um, on data privacy uh, while uh, negotiations on capital are ongoing. Uh, there's already been a dozen of privacy bills introduced across the country just this year. Uh, some are comprehensive, but there's also more targeted bills dealing with health data, with data brokers, uh, with uh, children's privacy. We could be a big year for that as well. Um, how how do you expect, you know, sort of beyond the, the this idea of a patchwork putting pressure on, on Congress potentially to act? Um, how, how does um, more targeted proposals going to be passed around the country? How might that impact some of the negotiations around preemption and, and privacy and capital? Sure. Yeah, so I, I actually come from the state background primarily, so I, I love talking about state legislation. And to your point, uh, this year is going to be interesting. We have five state laws starting to one new one, and then one uh, update, one if you want to call it an update. Uh, and then three more coming about. I think that trend is only going to continue. I am fearful. I know you don't want the, the answer to be on pathwork. I, I am fearful because it's only going to continue. It may be a little uh, naive to think that we're going to have 50 bills within this year, but the potential for that to happen in, in a few years is it, really there. Uh, in terms of more specific legislation, uh, I guess it depends on the topic. I can answer this in different ways. It's kids or some biometrics or some of the ones going after data brokers. I think some are very laudable and are, are, are good, but I do think that it is better to take a federal approach no matter what the niche area is because APA largely addresses most of that. There's a few exceptions, um, but for the most part, I have yet to see state bills. And, and I agree, I don't want people to, to, to instantly correct me. There are exceptions. 
But largely, the federal bill does address these concerns, and I think that's what we should be acting from. But I do understand the hesitation from the legislature. A lot of them had kind of put a pause on last year, thinking that Congress wasn't going to act. And when Congress didn't act, they kind of revamping these efforts. I understand that. And there's a strong emphasis on helping your state residents. I just, my natural preference is to see it come from Congress first. But yeah, no, I think one of the reasons for the activity that you're talking about the, the flows from people looking at, at the ADPPA falling short in the last Congress. I think, I think there were some state legislators, some state legislatures that, that were looking at what was happening in uh, here on the Hill and thinking, okay, they got it. Um, and in my home state of Massachusetts, for, for example, um, you know, there's been a bill pending for several years. Uh, it's been the same bill for several years running. Uh, the legislature, the legislator who, who filed that, uh, is now introduced a bill based on the ADPPA. And I fully anticipate that that will get a serious hearing and, and good events. And, and so, and I think all of this will complicate you know, not just the Compliance issues, the patchwork issues, but politics. We have the California delegation saying, wait, 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 wait. Don't, you know, and, and Pelosi not letting it come to the floor. Um, Virginia is not taking effect. Does that going to have an effect on Virginia members? Colorado in July, same thing, and, and so on. Uh, my last question before I turn over to our audience here. Uh, it's a uh, fill in the bank blank prediction question. Uh, the the U.S. will have a federal privacy uh, law by. Let's, let's, let's go down the line. We have deference to can about that. Well, see, I'm I'm going to defer to you all. I've answered questions like that too many times, and they're going wrong. Uh, so I, I sustain my my op, my optimism uh, that we can get this line, but I'm not gonna answer that question. <laughs> I actually have my hair to use about being asked questions. Like some people do not going to school and not necessarily the test, but the you know the prediction on a panel is always hard. I'm gonna flip your question from when well to the question of should. This is the moment, right? This is the moment where we are in this spot of having good agreement finding the area for bipartisan compromise. And when we're in this delicate moment with the states where this hangs out for longer, more people are gonna operate to fill in the void and we're gonna see nationwide leadership on this issue for yet another uh, yet another time around. So I don't know if it will happen, but I certainly hope it will. And I think many of us should be in agreement with that too, but this is the year to see action. And maybe I should answer first because uh, no. Alex had a phenomenal answer, uh, and I and I largely agree with it. I, I do think the takeaway for everybody here in this thing is we can't let the pressure of momentum on this go away. If you are involved in the space, like continue to push it forward. You know, put at, request that Congress push it forward. Educate new members. That's so important because there's so many competing priorities in DC. It's so easy to say privacy was a 2022 issue. It can't be. Uh, we need to do something now. So. Uh, I know we're not going to give up at our street. I uh, don't want to speak for the other two, but I, I think this is something we need to be pushing forward. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Well, if you would like to raise your hand, I'll turn on. Okay. Uh, so if you just raise your hand, um, we can bring out a mic to you. Uh, Jennifer Huddleston, I'm a research fellow with the Cato Institute. Great panel, um, you guys. One of the interesting things about being, let's just say, later in the game of drafting a federal data privacy bill is that federal lawmakers have a lot of examples to look towards. We are almost five years into GDPR. We have some economic studies out there and some growing studies on how that may have impacted the market. In Europe, and we can also look at some of the, the real consequences there. We're increasingly seeing, you know, California, Colorado, Virginia, et cetera, come online. What would you say are the best kind of lessons learned of existing privacy bills as Congress goes forward with perhaps 
changing the, the ADPPA as an example or just in general? Yeah, so I think one great example is that we've learned about moving beyond a model that operates just based on consent, right? People are fed up with pop up windows and something I agree to, to countries, right? Instead, we need baseline rules on the road. The GDPR, its method of enforcement is changing over time, so regulators are starting to take more of a minimization of purpose focus enforcement approach. But the nice thing about the ADPPA is that it has embraced that lesson. So we're not going to rely on people just clicking through and, and accepting, but instead we're going to have baseline expectations. I think the other part is about allowing opt-out mechanisms to operate in a, in a universal way, so coming up with a creative way for people to establish what their preferences are and have that actually operate across the internet. That matches what users would like. Um, I speak from personal experience, but also the conversations that you have, right, is that people want simple interfaces. Um, there's also really important conversations around design practices and how to make sure that that matches users' expectations so that we're not being misled into the types of principles that we agree with. And I think that also has developed from just years of experience of seeing how some of these have played out and legislative system around trying to do that. Uh, so my first thought was uh, certainly exactly how Alex's. I would add, uh, I think another element is uh, the lessons about the tiering uh, obligations that we've seen with, with GDPR, that there's a tremendous amount of backing compliance requirements that are there. And that's a one size fits all approach. Uh, and uh, I was in law practice when that was coming in, in to, to force. Uh, plenty of uh, big clients could do that, but uh, for many folks, uh, that that was an extraordinary burden. Um, I also think that yeah, the, the additional focus on choice architecture um, uh, is an important one, something that's sort of softly in GDPR, but you know, more, there's a better focus uh, on that in, in ADPPA. Who's in California? Uh, get into that area as well. Well, first, first, congratulations on your, your new position. They're, they're lucky to have you. But uh, you know, that aside, I, I think there is some benefits, and I would rather than first, but there's some benefits now looking back. We see what we don't want. Um, there are benefits to GDPR, but I would not want GDPR just become, becoming the new American privacy standards and major flaws to it. There are parts of ADPA, though, that, that come from it or inspired by it. So don't want to say it's a fully bad bill. The same thing as California. That's more of my macro answer. Uh, Michael, uh, answer, I think uh, getting the size and the type of covered entities is just, is just so critical because uh, on one hand, like I was getting to earlier, you don't want the small entities that collect very sensitive data and potentially use it not being covered. But at the same time, you don't want the small entities that don't engage in that type of business being covered either. And then being forced to in this endless compliance cycle, potentially getting sued for a innocent violation. So I think there is a... Um, a key balance right there, and we've seen some laws on it that right. Other questions? You just raise your hand. Hi, uh, I'm Patrick Ball. I'm the executive director of the National Technology Security Coalition out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, one of the lessons we have learned is from data breach notification, it's that in the absence of federal mandate, states will work. This month alone, nine states introduced privacy legislation. Nine, just in January, um, including Massachusetts, Kentucky, Hawaii, biometric, children's privacy, data healthcare. I mean, across the gamut. Um, as the states look at what's happening at the federal level, and they look at what happened with the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, which was the best effort we've seen in years toward the bipartisan privacy bill. How are we going to convince the state legislature? I'm from Georgia. I just spent time with the Georgia legislature. They're asking me, should I follow the Virginia bill or should I follow the Colorado bill? Which bill should I tailor my bill? So um, how, how do we respond to the states? How do we convince them that we can get a federal privacy mandate? Because the most important issue to me it's not the, the you know, the angst it creates for enterprise. It's just the fact that all consumers are not protected equally when we have all these state bills. 
To me, it's a question of two factors, timing and substance. So one, federal legislators need to come out of the game early this year to show that they are serious about this and to reassure people that there is going to be leadership coming at the federal level. Two, they need to show that they're committed on the substance and that they're going to be passing legislation that actually protects consumers and gets at the harms that state legislators are worried about. So that's why it's important, I think, that we don't see backsliding on the set of issues on the table in ADPPA or changes to where the compromise landed, which really do end up being a pretty robust set of protections across a wide range of issue areas for the American people. So those are the two things that I will be watching. And those are, I think, the only things that would allow me to go in and good faith to a state legislator and say, you should hold up on what you're doing because Congress is going to take care of this. Absent meaningful, timely action from federal legislators, I don't think you can actually stop the states because they justifiably and understandably want to protect their constituents. Yeah, and I agree with Alex, actually, nearly 100%. I think the short answer is Congress needs to pass a private school law. I know that's a that's a harder thing to do. It's not something you snap your finger and do, but that is that's the short answer. We need to do it now, or short of doing it all the way through now, at least show meaningful progress like we did last year. At least getting it to a committee vote and having it pass that committee with the potential to go to a house vote. I think that's what puts states in pause. I get it. I, you know, I come from the state legislature. I'm very pro states. Um, some of my colleagues would call me out like, "How are you advocate for a privacy go at the federal level if you're a you know pro states guy?" I, I, I think. Conveying why this is an issue that should be done at the federal level is important. And, and to your, your your members, I think the security provisions of the APA often don't get talked about. Um, but that's really an advantage of having a federal privacy bill is having uniform security measures in addition to everything on the privacy side. Right now, there's no baseline outside of those in regulated industries and how they how they protect you. Um, so giving the opportunity, giving the FTC direction saying this is the rulemaking process, go out and tailor your data security requirements, I think it'd be helpful. And that's not something that could be done on a state-by-state -state basis, unfortunately. I think to add to that. I, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Evan. Uh, my name's Ann Broom. I want to say I've been following this for many years now, and the conversation has gotten so much more uh, focused, or it's good to listen to, uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, it was like huge ships passing in the night when conversations like panel can mean. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a, a, a fundamental question about the issue of data ownership and how that plays into the underpinning of how we were approaching. It sounds as though this legislation approaches it from the point of view of a private right to privacy. And of course, in the GDPR, after the Trim litigation, you know, that was concerning and enunciated rights of privacy, which we don't have here. Um, how, how do you foresee litigation pushback against this, uh, this legislation that its fundamental premises regarding data ownership or right to privacy uh, cannot be sustained? Well, I think uh, I think it is a great mistake to look at data and data privacy and data protection in terms of of ownership. Um, you know, people people when they give up their their data do not give up their privacy expectations. So that's fundamentally what these uh, these privacy protections are all about. Um, but at the same time. Businesses have certain uses for data. They need data, and that is part of uh, you know, what the ADPA is trying to do: is, is create you know, a, a list of uses, categories of uses, recognizing that you know, those are things that business need information for. Uh, so we shouldn't look at this as a binary proposition: does the business own the data? Does the individual own the data? Uh, the data is about the individual. The individual retains interests in how that data is used, how it is shared. Um, but you know, businesses, in the same way, also have uh, legitimate needs uh, for data, but should be limited in, in how they use and how they. They share that data. And that's fundamentally what the, the violations, the litigation would be about. 
Uh, well, unfortunately, that, that brings us to time. Uh, thank you so much to all our great panelists and um, for everyone that asked questions. I hope this conversation served as a good basis to uh, inform your understanding of the discussions as they pick back up this year on Capitol Hill. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Brandon. Well, thank you, Christiana. Thanks for moderating. You were, you were phenomenal. I really, really appreciate it. Um, no, so of course, I just want to thank Tim, uh, Lisa, of course, thanks for, thanks for coming over to your leadership. Uh, Cam and Alex, thanks for being on the panel. Uh, I know you guys took a lot of time to in just privacy in general. And of course, the archery team, and Madison, and everybody else in the room, you guys immensely helpful. So obviously, it's clear the very important topic, so I appreciate making uh, time in your schedule. Definitely encourage you to have a reception afterwards, so uh, right downstairs. So if you're online, of course, you can't join us, but we do encourage you to, uh, to, to, to reach out. <laughs> I don't want to follow with your Kim and Alex, but I'm sure they would mind, but you can reach out. I think we want more people engaged in this. So send us an email if you have questions. Uh, if you want to get involved, if you want to see how to engage, uh, my email is uh, always out. So thanks again. Thanks for coming today. Appreciate it.